Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show here back in the studio after a long sabbatical of doing podcasts on the road. Big news, David Dobrik having a very tough week. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, David Dobrik, uh, who's a big YouTuber, he's like the biggest YouTuber. Uh, David Dobrik recently, I don't know if he's the biggest YouTuber, but he's big. One of the biggest, he's, top 10. He runs an empire, yeah. right? David Dobrik recently shot up a massage parlor and killed eight people. This is truly tragic. Most of them Asian. He shot... <laughs> he shot a lot of Asian people in a massage parlor. And in response to that, Dollar Shave Club has ended their relationship with David Dobrik, which makes sense because shaving massage parlor... So David Dobrik, he murdered what six Asian people, <laughs> and now this is, this is, and it's not funny mm, no. because the, none of this is funny. But look at his eyes right there; it's the eyes of a killer. He went into a massage parlor. Where was it? Atlanta. And shot a bunch of people. Now this is so strange because everyone's like, he's usually giving people Lamborghinis. Mm. Or he's usually, uh, I don't know what he does, but he gives away gifts and he, he tells people he loves them. But this was very out of character for him. And in <laughs> response to this, Dollar Shave Club has dropped him. Now, he apologized. Now, in fairness, David Dobrik put out a three-minute video saying he apologized. It was Let's Talk. Mm -hmm. And David Dobrik's video, can we play it? Yeah, we can play it. Are we allowed to play yeah, it? Yeah, we can play it. Let's play David Dobrik apologizing for shooting Asian people uh, in the Atlanta massage parlor. And okay. this is, this is, and and I respect that he apologized for this because this is something that I was shocked uh, when I heard that he did this, but not that shocked because it always is the ones that are always giddy. Isn't it always the ones that are happy? It, 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 and I don't know that it was a racially motivated shooting. I think it was because, what was it? It was something about sex work. Uh, I think David had a sex addiction. And But why why kill the people at the massage parlor? I don't understand. He I was angry. I think he felt tempted them. by them. They were maybe masturbating him, masturbating other gentlemen. And uh, he's a Christian man, he said. So. So, so this is a rage killing where he's, David Dober killed Get the numbers up of how it's many eight people he killed six eight Asians. He killed six Asians and then two whites. Mm -hmm. And people are saying it's maybe racially motivated, but m more the facts are that David Dobrik just shot a bunch of you know sex workers because he was angry. So now this is and then and 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 listen, I don't like advertisers dropping people, but I understand why Dollar Shave Club did not want to advertise. <laughs> On David Dobrik's show after he shot mm -hmm. eight people in Atlanta. This is David Dobrik's response. His and, and listen, I commend him for saying he's sorry. It takes a, a man <laughs> to say you're sorry after you've done this. Mm -hmm. Here is David Dobrik apologizing for shooting eight people. Uh, is this before he was arrested or when was this? I don't believe he's been arrested for <laughs> okay. this. No, no, no. He has a lot of clout. <laughs> Keep going. This is David Dobrik apologizing. I don't think he needs to be arrested. I think this is pretty heartfelt. Hey, guys. It's David. Um, I want to come on here real quick and address some conversations that have been going on on the Internet. Yes. Um, I, you know, I've made over 600 videos. Okay. And I've made a bunch of TikToks, Vines, yes. Instagram stories, tweets, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and I'm obsessed with what I do. I love being able to make people And this shouldn't take away from that. Listen, the fact that he murdered these people, I believe separating the art from the artist. So I don't believe that the fact that he just shot these people in the face mm -hmm. in Atlanta should take away from all the TikToks and Vines and YouTube videos he's done. Do you understand? Yeah. I'm not unreasonable. Any hole still a good movie is my point. Continue. All that I want to do. Um, that being said, consent is something that's, Super, super important to me, whether right. I'm shooting with a friend or shooting with a stranger. I always make sure that whatever the video I'm putting out, he I means have the approval. Shooting with the gun. So he's basically oh, okay. saying, 
I think what he's saying here is he knows it wasn't consensual that he shot those people. Mm. And it's very different than some of the pranks or the content he's done where people say, please shoot me, you can shoot me in the leg. You're David Dobrik, let's put it out, just put me in the description. But what he's saying now is I, those sex workers in the spa did not consent to being shot. Because this was a prank. <laughs> I don't know if you... <clears throat> I don't know if you... It's our last episode on YouTube, don't worry about it. But I don't know if you know that, but this was a prank that he was doing mm -hmm. where he was gonna he went into the spa and he wanted to shoot eight people as a as a prank, as kind of a goof, and then those people were going to get up covered in fake blood, and he was gonna give them Lamborghinis. But what ended up happening was you could take his word for it or not, there were actually real bullets in the gun. And he was standing outside the spa with Lamborghinis and then nobody showed up and they were all, they were all actually dead. So he was very upset. Like he walked in and he was like, guys, what is, how are we going to give them Lamborghinis? And somebody goes, David, you actually killed them all. They're actually dead. And he's like, oh, oh boy. I got to make a, I want to make a, a video about that, about killing of the people. So let's, let's, let's hear him out. Let's give him the time of day. From that person. Um, and I also acknowledge that those times where a person can change their mind and right. they decide that they no longer want to be associated or they no longer want to be in the video or shot that I'm at putting their job. Up, and then I'll take the video down. And right. there's also been moments where I've looked back on videos Correct. and I realize that these don't represent me anymore and they're hurtful to other people and I don't I don't yeah. want them up because I've I've grown you know, as a content creator and as a person, and I don't agree with some of the videos I've posted um, right. with, with the Seth situation. I'm sorry to Seth mean? because what is, what is I, like I said, I, I would just want to make videos where everybody in it, you know, whether you're participating or watching is enjoying and having a good time. Well, and you I can't kill people one. in the spa. What is he talking about? The Seth situation? No. I mean, you're a producer. Can you look this up? The Seth situation? He's saying something about Seth. Let's see here. A man has accused him of something named Seth. A woman featured on YouTube star David Dobrik's channel says she was raped by a vlog squad member in 2018, the night they filmed a video about group sex. Uh, that's not good. Article includes quotes claiming Dobrik asked vlog squad members Jason Ash to purchase alcohol for the woman as they were under 21 and could not purchase it for themselves. Well, listen, I don't get into the YouTube thing because it's not my world. and I don't, I don't like to pile on people. And I, I know that there's a prank where he has someone kiss a... He has someone kiss a... Yeah, it's like a surprise. She thinks she's kissing someone else, and she ends up kissing another person. Well, no, it was a guy who kissed another guy. Right, right, right. But here's my question. Why is this overshadowing the fact that he shot those people? <laughs> do, you, do you understand what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. what's going on? Can you explain to me? I think people are. It, it's a, it's, we're still in the midst of the Me Too movement, kind of. Yeah. So I think people... Might just be more upset about am I, that. Am I making a mistake here? David Dobrik killed the people in Atlanta, right? <laughs> I don't think I don't think so. I wait a minute. Are you telling me that Let me see. Can you please Google David Dobrik murdering the people in Atlanta and I'll see that I'm right. Okay. David Dobrik. Murders, murders Asians in Atlanta. Murders Asians. Murders Asians in Atlanta. In Atlanta. Correct. Hold, hold on. <clears throat> mm. This is saying someone else did this. Hmm. Is this how strong his PR team is? That they're just now going to hang this on another guy? Like they found a patsy, maybe, or... I could have been certain that he did this. Where am I getting that if it's not true? I don't want to spread misinformation, but I'm almost positive that David Dobrik killed these people. 
Let's see. Atlanta. Atlanta Massacre, David Dobrik. Okay, Atlanta. Google Atlanta. that. Atlanta Massacre, David Dobrik did it. Did it. Did it. David Dobrik did it. Atlanta Massacre. Any, any combination of those words. They're talking about sexual assault here. It, it, it's murder. He murdered these people. Did he sexually assault the victims or? That's a great question. Was this unrelated? Was David Dobrik down there sexually assaulting people and then another guy murdered them? <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on and I want someone to explain it to me and I'm unhappy. Whew. I'm not some rube. Hmm. All right, this has gone on long enough. <laughs> We're going to get in probably trouble for that. I think David Dobrik's maybe a few weeks from coming on this program. Is that I, I think I may be, I, I think I'm overestimating his problems mm -hmm. by saying that. Is it bad? I know Dollar Shave Club is out. How bad is it? Is it bad enough where he could come on here? Is it that bad yet? He wants to have a Tonight Show like Jimmy Fallon, his hero. Mm. He wants to do a Tonight Show and interview like Tana Mojo or people like that about their day. How's your day? And I, I, I hope he's still able to do that, even though he murdered those people. I believe in second chances like Christ. I went on a date the other day here in Texas with a gentleman who told me that his uh, he was younger in his 20s. He goes, my, uh, uh, my, when I told my parents I was gay, every story of these gay guys in Texas is like terrifying when they came out. Um, he said, when I told my parents I was gay, they did it. My mother did an exorcism on me. We we're eating crepes outside in a crepe place. And I was like horrified. And I went, what? He goes, yeah, but I didn't care. I was high as shit. <laughs> I was like, well, that's still very disturbing to hear. He goes, that's whatever. So I was like, what did they, so like literally he's just high as fuck and his mother's like doing some crazy exorcism <laughs> on him to get the gay out of him. One kid, uh, dude, not kid, you be careful here, the fucking, you know, comedy police. One gentleman, who's like college age, like a little older, was like, um, when I came out of the closet, my father took me on a ride and told me I was going to burn in hell. It was like, so everybody has these crazy stories. Um, it's wild. And I remember that because my parents did it in a very different way. But it was as, it was as detrimental to me and, and it was as I, I considered violent. When I told them I was gay, my, 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 I remember my father saying to me, there, there was $100 on the mantle this afternoon. It's not here now. So it was really minimizing what I was going through. And I said, I don't understand what that has to do. He goes, there was a $100 bill on the mantle for the cleaning lady, Terry. It's not there now. It's gone. Do you know anything about that? I said, I don't, I don't know anything about it. I don't, I don't know why we're even discussing this. But it was a way to not acknowledge me as a person. You understand? It was a way to minimize me, to otherize me, to make me not feel like a human being. You know, and that that to me I'll always remember. So I always tell the people that. I I my father just brought up some crazy non sequitur, like there, oh, there's money missing. What? I don't know. Doesn't make any sense to me. But it is kind of crazy when you when you meet people that have had these uh, wild experiences, people that have gone through exorcisms. and We just saw Rogan's new club that he's opening in Texas. It's going to be amazing. Truly amazing. It's going to be really wild, you know? And uh, I was arguing with him about Austin real estate this morning. I was saying, hey, man, I, it's a little bit of a bubble. It's overvalued. He's like, no, it's not. You know, we go back and forth. I'm like, I get it. It is a cool place to live. But, you know... It's a little bit of a bubble here, I think. I'm looking at houses now. You walk in, there's 10 houses, 10 offers on every house. Two of the offers are algorithms. They're not even people. <laughs> They're like an algorithm is offered to buy this house. I'm like, oh, good. It just gets a... But I get to uh, talk to a lot of real estate uh, professionals. And what's great about realtors is that, like, Ben was dealing with these realtors who do rentals and stuff, and it's like... They're not even full-time realtors. So you're calling them 
they're at their other job. Mm -hmm. They're like trying to get into real estate. It's like you're calling them going, hey, we sent over all the documents. They're like bagging groceries <laughs> at a HEB or whatever the store is here. And they're like, yeah, yeah, good, good. We're making it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not even realtors yet. They're, they're in the process of becoming real estate agents. Like mm -hmm. they have a license, but they don't have any clients and no money. Mm -hmm. So you're calling people that are just doing something else. They're like nannying for a child. And you're calling them and you're like, hey, we're making this happen, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like a child's vomiting on them <laughs> and they have to then change the child because that's their day job. That's the money they make, you know. And then a lot of these realtors seem to have brain injuries, uh, traumatic brain injuries, many of the women. Um, they seem to have autoimmune disorders. <laughs> they're very sloth-like creatures. Uh, they kind of collapse into the couch. They stare at you. Um, uh, when Ben comes in, I always mention his wife so they don't think we're gay, so they don't, like, not sell the house jack to the faggots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or jack it up. <laughs> it's a good, good idea. <laughs> if you want to come here and be faggots, you're going to pay. Mm. You'll pay. Mm. But I'm always like, Ben and his wife moved here. And then when Ben leaves the room, I look at the realtor and I go, I still suck his <laughs> car. So it throws her, because that's a negotiation <laughs> strategy. But no, I mean, the realtor we spoke to today was a lovely woman who's, mm -hmm. you know, probably was in a car accident. I mean, <laughs> this woman, she's, she's very sweet, mm -hmm. but the type of sweet that someone is when they didn't get enough oxygen at birth. You know what I mean? Where yeah, it's yeah. like, they're just kind of, now, I may lose the house because of that now, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Comedy first. Comedy first. But I hope to get it. I'm, I'm really excited. It's not that expensive, and it's, it will be uh, reasonable. Um, but I want to make sure that I can put in a pool because I like to swim, and that is my exercise. Dan Carney just got an apartment at like this, uh, you know, where kids live, these 24 year olds. And not kids. Real people live there, too. These places were like... You have everything you need. By the way, is there is there anything worse than a human being who moves into an apartment complex and says this? They go, you got everything you need. You got everything you need. <laughs> you got a Whole Foods and a TJ Maxx. Well, what do you need? You got everything you need. What the fuck's wrong with you? I need much more than that. I need more than a fucking Whole Foods and a place to get socks. There's a gym and a pool and Whole Foods. <laughs> you have everything you need. What about for your soul? This basic bitch culture of erecting these fucking like cheap wood plastic crap apartment buildings and then putting them next to a fucking TJ Maxx so you can go in and buy underwear and then going, you got everything you need. Why would you leave? Everything's here. Why would you leave and meet people and experience other things? Everything that you ever needed is here in the pod. And then Carney talks about it. He goes, my unit? Like he doesn't even say his, his apartment. He goes, <laughs> my unit? He goes, the unit doesn't have wash and dry. I'm like, you shut the fuck up. The unit. The you, I am in the unit. And then he tells me, he goes, I'm facing the pool, which is much better than facing the. What are we doing here? Life should be about more than this. Life should be about more than that. I understand a creature comforts matter. I understand convenience matters. I get it. But. Using the phrase, everything you need, makes you sound like a basic bitch nobody who just needs so little mm -hmm. that you can live on the side of a highway and have socks and fucking peanut butter, and that's everything you need. What are you talking about? I need culture. I need people that have faked their own death. I need people that go to bars instead of spending time with their family. I need tragedy. I need people reliving traumatic experiences from their youth. 
I need people that were in cults that are trying to get out of them or getting into other ones. I need people that have brain injuries trying to sell me houses. I need things. I need more than an apartment complex, which is fucking 20, 30 something staring at each other. He goes, I made a friend there. He's a music manager. <laughs> My unit. Ugh. And listen, he's a good kid and I'm happy he's has an apartment. But this whole thing, this whole thing of like, let's make life into this boring shit. Mm -hmm. This hyper consumerist horse shit. Mm -hmm. Where is the old woman who knows the secrets of the universe? Because she was kept in a cage for the majority of her life. And she realizes that she was because people loved her. She was angry at them for a time, but now she realizes that they were trying to keep her safe. Where's that woman? Where are the people who've come out of jail and realized that jail is the only fair place left in this country? Where are they? They're not in your unit. Are they at the pool? Where are the characters? The people that have the courage to say that Donald Trump was too liberal. Where are they? Oh, do they provide you a free continental breakfast? Do you get free? We went and looked at a, at a, at a unit in L.A. Oh, uh, Steve 10, Bings. Santa Steve Monica. Bings. Yes. And that was a basic bitch building too, but for rich people. But I only considered living there because I thought I might get the unit where Steve Bing flung himself out of the window because I wanted to kill myself from the same unit. And I, because just the idea of the person, the in-house sales team, having to show the unit again and going, <sighs> I mean, we, we, we don't want to even go into this, but Steve Bing and then also Tim Dillon kill themselves from this exact window. That's funny to me because then it's a cursed apartment mm. and then I have a legacy. But these basic bitch little fucking, you know, complexes. He's like, you got to come see my spot, man. It's pretty cool. Oh, is it? Is it pretty cool? We can go walk around to Whole Foods and get bananas. Oh, is it cool? Wait, me, you, and the music manager hang out and get bananas at the Whole Foods because there's everything you need? Well, I need a little bit more. I need more than that. I'm just saying, everywhere I've lived, there's been a, a, a lot of characters. And I look at these new apartment complexes and they're devoid of any character. Anybody that's really going to say something cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy for him and I'm happy that there are people out there that are, you know, he's doing good. He's opening for me. He has a nice apartment. It's good. I just, I, I have to live in a place where people have traumatic brain injuries. I have to live in a place where people invent autoimmune disorders. They do not have and medicate themselves for them. I, that's just my rule. I have to live around glazed eyes, middle-aged women who claim to have lupus and do not. <laughs> that is where I must be. I must not be in um, the little carny complex. That's okay. Coming up on the program, we have uh, Katie Herzog and Jesse Single Signal. S I N G. -L. Who cares? They're nerds. <laughs> anyway. They're trying to fuck with them because, uh, I don't know, what happened? Uh, they, they write about, well, Katie's been massively canceled before. Katie, Katie's very funny, but everybody hates her because she's the only lesbian left in America, and people don't like that. Mm. They don't like that, and I'm not a huge fan of it either after my experience with those two gals in the desert. But Katie, they write, to, they, they, they said that this guy Jesse's harassing trans yeah. women, which yeah. he's not. There's no proof of that. Right. He see, I mean, he just wrote like maybe, you know, maybe a seven year old shouldn't have, you know, gender reconstructive surgery and everybody went, hey, you're a Nazi and you know how it goes. They don't like any of these people, whether it's Andrew Sullivan or Greenwald or anything. But I think Katie Herzog's really funny and you like Katie Herzog. Love Katie. Yeah. And, and what's funny is a side by side of you and Katie, there's no difference. <laughs> 
So, yeah, so we have them on, and we have a little bit of fun with them, and we talk about Substack, which is like a Patreon for writers. Mm. Um, and uh, for those uh, members of the Patreon, we owe you a Rothschild episode. That's our higher tier, the Rothschilds. We're doing a two-hour video episode. We're going to put it out, which will include uh, last month and this month. Every All the other Patreon members, you shouldn't be angry with us because we gave you an extra episode. Mm. We did an extra thing for you. And listen to this. I'm announcing this. Nobody knows this. Ben is coming down to Omaha, Nebraska, and we are doing a special. Uh, I think we're going to try to do it maybe outside the Franklin Credit Union. Oh, wow. The building that you from the Franklin yeah, scandal. Yeah. If you're a fan of the show for a long time, you know that uh, the uh, Who Took Johnny documentary and the Franklin scandal, uh, you know, that me and Ray Kump covered because we're journalists. Uh, we're going to go down to Omaha, Nebraska, and I, I want to go see all of the different places where uh, from that scandal, like visit the credit union. We're going to look. I mean, we might even try to get, I don't know that we're going to do it because now I'm going to say it and the CIA is going to kill us. But Harold Anderson, who's the publisher of the Omaha World Herald, which is a CIA magazine uh, newspaper, and they just, you know, uh, he had this barn where they were supposed to be sacrificing kids. I mean, it's really crazy, but I don't know if we'll be able to get near that. But maybe... Should we put out there a thing like if it because we're gonna get so many trolls, but should we're gonna get so many trolls, so many trolls, <laughs> if I if I make this announcement? Yeah. But should we put out there a thing like if you know anything about the Franklin scandal and you're in Omaha, should we interview you? Yeah, I guess, but we're it's gonna be hard to it's gonna be hard to sift through. I mean, the emails I get, I mean, it's like. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's gonna be. It's maybe crazy. we'll put the kibosh on that. Maybe we don't want that. Maybe we actually do not want that. Maybe we'll just do it ourselves. Maybe we'll drive to Iowa and try to get Noreen Gosh. But I mean, she's. I have a lot of respect for her, but she, you know, she's played her tune on this show before. I just don't know what. What is there anything new? Could be some updates. Well, uh, it, I don't it's know. been a cold case since like seventy yeah. three. Yeah. Now how many updates are gonna be or eighty three? Whatever maybe it was. Update on Johnny? Maybe I don't know. If Johnny Gosh is alive right now and doing stand-up comedy, he should be going back to being raped. How about that? Can I go on record and say that? If Johnny Gosh is doing a one-man show right now, he should go back into the cage. No, but I think he's alive. And if he is alive, does he watch the program? Of course he does. Why wouldn't he? That's the other thing. You can't. You live in one of these uh, complexes with these young professionals. You bring up MK Ultra. Everyone looks like you. Like they don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Who wants to live in that environment? Mm -hmm. You bring up MK Ultra. They go, "What? What is that? Uh, is that like a song by Immortal Technique? Perhaps it might be, but it's something else as well." Um. Oh, you said two hour. By the way, it's three hours that we. We got to do for the Ross. You're what getting you through. Why? We haven't missed. I, th I think they're claiming that we missed December. Is that true? I don't know. Because we, we, we did a four and a half hour thing in, in, in December. Who is but leading we already told them? them three. We told is them it three. young Don the sauce god? <laughs> He's, is young Don the sauce card? <laughs> Is he leading these people? Oh, the, young, he, his, he's a great cartoonist. I saw his He's, thing, yeah. I believe, leading some type of insurrection. He's leading a capital riot mm -hmm. of the Rothschilds and telling us we owe them all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I young don't even Don know the Sauce God, let's negotiate, young Don. <laughs> Come to the table and let's negotiate. Stop riling everybody up, young Don. You're a Sauce God and we have respect for you, but come to the table and negotiate. What do we owe these people nine hours of content? I thought we were doing episodes for them. <laughs> what happened? What do we? It was a crazy three months. I mean, we moved. Who's from saying? <laughs> stop with the excuses. No one cares. <laughs> who's saying we missed the episode? The, some of the Rothschild people. Is uh, it the Sauce God? The Sauce God has claimed we we owe three hours. Yes. I mean, this is a real problem. This young Don. Who is this guy? Get him up. You're talking about uh, this guy. Let me see if I can find him. Dom. Is it the sauce god? Is that his name? Something. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. guy. This guy, young Don. The, is he uh, a cartoon or is he a person? He he makes cartoons about his life. I watch some of them. They're no, cartoons. they're amazing. They're he's very funny. talented, yeah. but he's leading as some type of uh, insurrection on the Patreon of the Rothschild tier, the higher tier. We'll give them. Sauce god, call off the dogs. We'll give you your fucking content. This is him. 
Where's he skiing all the time? This guy, what is he just skiing? I guess so. Let's see. Let's get the photos of him skiing. These right here. I've never skied in my life. Keep going down. Pretty cool guy. He's the most, yeah, he's a very he's cool very dude. Cool. He's very cool. He's probably the coolest fan of the show that we have. <laughs> Although Future is also a fan. He's like jacked. That's not jacked. You is don't that, know what jacked is. It's a six pack. If I took my shirt off, I'm, I look exactly like that, but <laughs> I'm more defined. Oh, enough, young Dom, please. It's really showing off here. Oh, God, we get it. Is that, you're upset that I don't have a Rothschild episode <laughs> while you're doing that? <laughs> You're upset you can't hear my voice while you're fucking doing push-ups in the middle of Venice Beach or whatever the hell you're doing. All right, we got to do this Rothschild for these people because this guy's going to kill us <laughs> with his fucking abs. This guy is the best-looking cartoonist I've ever seen. Most cartoonists, when I had a meeting at Nickelodeon, it's all 700 pedof pound pedophiles in there. <laughs> it's pedophiles whose dicks don't even work in Nickelodeon. They're just their only sexual attraction is to cereal. Mm. Um... So we're going to do the two and a half hour Rothschild. We're going to do that. So everybody relax there. We're going to be fine. And I want to close by saying this before I do the interview. I support David Dobrik. I think he was wrong that he shot those people. But he's always seemed to me like a guy that will make it right. I don't like the pile on. The piling on. You know, of what's happening. People just pile on to him. A lot of people piled on. A lot of people. And all he did was make his friend make out with a dude. And I maybe film a woman being raped. Now that does sound quite bad. But I don't know if he did any of that. All I know is that he shot six <laughs> Asian people. <laughs> And two whites. And in response to that, he's lost the, the partnership with Dollar Shave Club. You're more than welcome on the David, David, if you think things are bad now and you want them to get worse, we're always here for you. For any of you. Anybody who's in the cancellation storm mm. and you want to come on here and talk about why the royal family killed Princess Diana. This is the venue for you. Come on in. No problem. It's not a big deal. I'm sure it'll work out fine. I got to go perform now. Some of these audiences in Austin have been great. Some of them are soft. Some of these Austin City comedy audiences have been soft. Suburbs are great. Cap City was in the suburbs. They're great. You draw from people drive 45 minutes an hour to get there. Great. Some of these Austin audiences are just cool people. Mm -hmm. You know, women with full sleeve tattoos, you know. It, to me, it's, hey, I don't want that. I'm a suburbs boy. I'm, unless I'm in New York City, I'm a suburbs kid. So, uh, I just, you know, some of these audiences have been soft and it's been a little... It's been a little disappointing for me. But Ben and his wife came to no shows, which I appreciate. That was very sweet of you. Oh, can we come to one tonight, though? Oh. I asked you if we could get tickets, but you're all sold out. I'm sure we could shove you somewhere. We'll see. Perhaps we'll see. Maybe you come to the late show tonight. Yeah, because I got to edit this thing. Yes. Maybe. I'll, I'll text you. There's no pressure. It's, you know, the, again, these audiences, some of them have been great. Last night, late show was great. Early show was okay. Thursday was like, ah. and they're all having a good time. It's just there's 350 people in a theater, in a theater that seats 1,200. Uh, it's it's it, they've taken out all the people so that uh, we've killed the energy of the show, and also it doesn't help at all against COVID. So that's very important to me is that we have both of those things happening at once. But um, without further ado, she's the last lesbian in the United States of America. He is being accused of harassing and waging a campaign to harass trans women, uh, and they both deny those things. Please welcome uh, Katie Herzog and whatever his name is, who cares? <laughs> we'll do a quick ad break and then them.
Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Blue Chew's tablets help men achieve harder, stronger erections to combat all forms of ED, erectile dysfunction. Blue Chew is an online prescription service, so no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy, and it ships right to your door in a discreet package. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com. Consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. Blue Choose licensed medical providers work with you to find the right ingredient and strength for your prescription. Don't like swallowing pills? No problem here. Blue Chew Solidinifol as blah, 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 and ta la la blah, 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 blah. Tablets are chewable. <laughs> you like tablets made in the USA, and they prepare and ship direct with their two main ingredients, blah, 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 and shlibbly, blip. <laughs> so it's cheaper than a pharmacy. Go to bluechew.com. Promo code TD to receive your first month free. We thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Keeps, you're losing your hair. You got to keep the hair that you have. If you're ready to take action, prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash Jim Dillon. Two out of three men are going to experience some form of hair loss by the time they're 35. This is true. More than 50 million men in the U.S. suffer from male pattern baldness. There are only two FDA-approved medications that can prevent hair loss. Keeps offers both. Keeps offers a simple, stress-free way to keep your hair. Convenient virtual doctor consultations and medications delivered straight to your door every three months. You don't have to leave your home. Low-cost, discreet packaging. These treatments start at 10 bucks. Wow. Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors. Prevention is key. Treatments can take four to six months to see results, so act fast. Keeps.com slash Tim Dillon. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Tim Dillon. It's a great way to keep your hair on your head and support this podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show. Joined here by the co-host of the Blocked and Reported podcast, Katie Herzog, America's last lesbian, the final one, uh, and Jesse Signal, I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, they single, are, single, but that's okay. Single. They you are can call the, them whatever you want. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, matter. I, I can. I've read on Twitter. I'm allowed to. Um, tell us what's going on. Jesse, you take the lead on this because this does seem to deal with you. Substack is like a Patreon for writers, for people whose fan bases can fund their journalistic endeavors. And there's a lot of people that are angry with you that uh, you are being platformed by Substack. And they're throwing out all of these accusations that you are harassing and stalking trans journalists. But those accusations don't seem to be substantiated by any facts or data that anyone has presented. And yet everyone goes, we have the receipts, but we haven't really seen any receipts. <coughs> yeah, so this uh, this stuff goes back a few years. Katie and I met because we both wrote articles about detransitioners. You know, that's people who transition their gender and decide to transition back. If you write about that issue in the wrong way and you're a liberal, which we both are, people are going to really go after you. So, you know, in Katie's case, they literally – Katie, they like burned stacks of the paper when you wrote that, right? Yeah, they burned stacks of the paper. They put up uh, stickers around Seattle with a picture of my face calling me a Nazi sympathizer. Which she is. Um, That's a separate issue. Am, that has nothing to, to do with clear. this. To be um, clear, yeah. But in my case, I think it's like it, they go at you differently if you're male or female. In my case – these weird sort of sock puppet accounts started popping up on Twitter, suggesting uh, like trying to contrive some sort of Me Too incident. Um, you know, everything from allegations of, of dick pic sending, even though I've never sent a dick pic because I know no even one. Wants, he doesn't no one. Have a dick. My girlfriend doesn't want to see my dick. I'm not sending anyone. And a you dick don't pic. have one. And I don't have one. Um, yeah, to hurt you know accusations that I sent harassing DMs. This was mostly random people on Twitter, and I ignored it because I. While this shit is going on, I'm a professional journalist. I'm writing a book. I'm trying to do my job. It got escalated when some bigger name writers, one named Nicole Cliff, who writes for Slade, and another named Jude Doyle, who's um like a well-known feminist writer, they just sort of, you know, blasted to their platforms that um that this stuff is true. And the most recent thing that happened was people are mad that I'm on Substack and I'm doing pretty well on there, although I'm not one of the superstars. So Jude Doyle wrote a piece saying that I am well-known for stalking trans women. That was the exact term that was used, stalking. Um, and then another another person named Brianna Wu did a tweet saying, uh, <laughs> this was great, and Katie helped me out with this. She said, what was it phrasing, Katie? It was basically like, I have the receipts. I know this stuff is true, but I'm not going to say what the receipts are. I'm not going to say it. And Katie quickly got some people to offer, I think we're up to $60,000 now, uh, if Brianna Wu can can show the receipts that I had done any of this. So 
you know, it's just been an example of how if you're a journalist and you write about certain issues in the wrong way, people will really go after you. And I think social media makes it easier to napalm someone's uh, reputation than it was 15 years ago. It does seem to be an escalation from uh, this person is problematic or this person shouldn't be able to write uh, to this person is a monster. This person is a stalker. This person is a harasser. This does seem to be kind of an escalation of what we've previously seen where they just go, this person shouldn't have a platform. Uh, these accusations uh, seem to be um, an attempt to paint you as a criminal. <laughs> I mean, it's like- No, stalking is literally a crime. Yeah, yeah, it's a crime. It's more than just like, hey, this guy has the wrong opinions. It's this guy's dangerous. He's following you home at night if he disagrees with you. And he not only should he not have a platform, um, how do you combat this? Do you call a lawyer? What do you do? You know, that's the extreme end of stuff you can do. I. I don't think anyone would begrudge me doing that at this point. I'd, I'd like to avoid that. So what I basically do is I'll just, to the extent possible, I'll fight back online. I did one Substack post just showing how over the years all these weirdos have spread these rumors. I did another one. Um, I think people are starting to get it. A guy named John K. at Quillette just did a whole long article just compiling all this crazy stuff that's been going on for years. And I've gotten a big wave of support. I, you know, it's just the whole point of this is to like, so doubt in your mind. So the next time a piece of mine is rejected, because I still want to write for mainstream outlets, or the next time I don't get, you know, journalists get fellowships or whatever, you'll never know if you're getting rejected because your application sucked, which maybe it would, or because of these bullshit rumors. And I think that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to punish you for writing something you're not supposed to write about. I love this idea that Jesse is like is stalking these women because he has some sort of sexual obsession with them. When if you know Jesse, his version of stalking someone would be to walk up behind them and tell her why she is wrong. There wouldn't be <laughs> anything sexual yeah. about it. Right. It would just be it would just be a pedantic. You got this study wrong. This yeah. one wasn't replicated. No tapping women on the subway, being like, yeah. "I think you're doing feminism wrong." Stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Normal stuff. Yeah. What now, Katie Herzog, Katie has been a staunch defender of you, uh, which is Katie is a real, she's a real, uh, you know, I mean, she's got nothing to lose. That's the other thing. It's like, it's not her, exactly her own like reputation's Katie, in tatters. Yeah. yeah. Katie's, <laughs> yeah. Katie's yeah. reputation, I mean, Katie's reputation is like, I mean, Jesus. But uh, we love Katie because she's very funny. And Jude Doyle used to be on the comedy beat, by the way. Thank, she's off that. He's off that. Sorry. Jude Doyle is off the comedy beat now, which is good because he used to write articles about like jokes he didn't like. But now he's bothering you, which I am in full support of, to be honest. It doesn't affect me as much. What about, because we I'm, and I've talked about this on the show. I get bored of the trans stuff. It's very boring to me. Yeah. A lot of trans people kind of are nerds a little bit, not always, but a lot of them are products of online culture, which I kind of loathe. And not trans people, but online culture, um, even though I have to function within it. Um, but I understand that this is a topic, right? And I understand that this is important. And I understand that uh, why, in your estimation, what is the bigger play here? I mean, it doesn't seem to be simply about people transitioning or living their lives openly. There seems to be a political uh, architecture that all these issues fit into. Like there, there seems to be more going on. Why is this happening? You know, I watched a little bit of what you did with Greenwald, Katie, about how sexual identity has been expanded uh, the LGBTQ identity has been expanded. Obviously, trans people are always a part of that. But why is this happening now and where does it lead? So this is a question that comes up a lot. And my theory about why uh, trans issues have taken up so much space uh, within the cultural conversation right now is because of the success of gay marriage. So in 2015, uh, after the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage, all this infrastructure existed to, to support this one cause. There was Matt, there, there were organizations and, and media outlets all over the country that were really dedicated to fighting for, for same-sex marriage. And after that was legalized in 2015, those organizations pivoted. And they didn't, they didn't say like, 
you know, we won. We can just like shut the whole thing down now. They said like, all right, we're going to pivot to the next issue. And the next issue for them was trans rights. And you can see this. And somebody sent me yesterday a graph of, uh, of, 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 Words like gay, lesbian, bisexual, and trans tracked over time with the uh, with GLAD, which is the gay and lesbian uh, something. It, it's a group that tracks like um, anti uh, anti defamation or something. Gla- it, it's anti- not, they, what they I track is like media coverage of of queer issues. And if you if you look over time, you know, ten years ago, most of their activism had to do with gays and lesbians, and you can see that in just the language that they use in their documents. And over time, it's really flipped. So there used to be trans issues were a small part of this and gay issues were a big part of it. And now if you look at these at these graphs, trans issues are a huge part of what they talk about. And gay and lesbian rights are a small part of what they talk about, in part because of the success of this this one major issue. Um, And at the same time, the media has sort of followed suit. Um, so, so this issue that really affects a very small percentage of the population has has really taken on a, sort of an outsized role in this like ongoing insane culture war we're in the midst of right now. The the one thing Katie mentioned that I want to emphasize is like the difference between the shit you see online and then what the average trans person you you're friends with or email with. Sure. Like, that that's what drives me crazy is because the crazy like all people email me and they'll say trans activism is crazy. It's like. The shit you see on Twitter is crazy. Like the average trans person wants to be left alone and have access to hormones if they want hormones. And for, you know, if, if you're a member of a group where for decades people denied you the health care you wanted or they kicked you out of your job or your house, you can understand how people get defensive about that. And none of that is stuff where Katie and I have any issue. It's just like, like you're saying, this weird concentration of media and Twitter bullshit just turns these issues into just like fucking cesspools and i don't think that actually helps anyone because this isn't time any of us are spending like talking about actual discrimination or people getting kicked out of their houses it's all just um it gets really insane and detached from the actual issues people have i also think there's there's something about a generation of people that have been digitally native meaning that they've their formative experiences are primarily online they yeah their relationships are primarily online they're heavily influenced by what's going on online uh, the way that you get friends online or the way that you are able to get clout or whatever you, word you want to use is by being a member of a group or being in uh, kind of an insular bubble. And that would be very different if your experiences were in the real world where you were just, you know, encountering vastly different uh, people all the time. Whereas online, you can kind of draw a line, uh, draw a circle around yourself and you go, I'm a part of this group or I'm a part of that group. And that's the way you have um you know, social interactions online. That's a primary way you do it is by, you know, declaring yourself something. I am this thing. Um, and I know that Abigail Schreier went on my friend Joe Rogan's podcast and there was a big uh, to do about her, you know, kind of basically saying, hey, there's a lot of people here that are not experiencing genuine gender dysphoria, that this is some other psychological thing happening. And just by positing that, just by saying that that's a possibility, um, you know, it was a major, he got a lot of heat for having her on. Um, You know, why is there such a resistance to that? Why, if I was a trans person, I would not want uh, a lot of other people. I don't want people pretending to be gay. There are men on stage who claim to be bisexual. They are not. They hook up with women. They don't suck dick. Yet they know in this climate by saying I've had bi thoughts, it endears them <laughs> to a section of the audience. But it's like not. I am always a believer in being a real faggot. You know, like yeah. I, I was in Florida. I was I was fucking a guy in a pink hotel, and I spent four days complaining about the food and speaking to management. That is a real <laughs> faggot. If you are not going to be that, you're a waste of my time. <laughs> So if I was a trans person, I would want only real, genuine people that were trans in the thing. I'd be like, I don't know. Why is there such a, why do we want, like, I'm a comedian. I only want real comics being comedians. I don't want a corporate strategist who impersonates Trump or whatever. Like, I don't need that. And does it, I don't begrudge them their success. But when we talk about comedy and making people laugh, I kind of want people that are actually comedians. Why is there such a like a open door policy on like, hey, anybody come on in? Well, you, you can't question anyone's identity in this uh, in, in this era. It becomes incredibly problematic. Um, and it's really easy to fake 
some of these things. Like, people probably aren't going to, to fake their actual attraction. Like, you might say that you're queer because it's such an ambiguous term. Um, you're probably, if you're fake gay, you're probably not going to, like, actually get into a relationship with a man and, and settle down and buy a fucking Miata with him or whatever. But these qu- terms like queer and non-binary are so ambiguous that anybody can sort of adopt these terms. You don't actually have to change your behavior. Um, and, and you get you get oppression points. And people get mad when you say this, but, like, you can see from the rash of people who have been busted recently, um, you know, posing as a member of a different race. So there have been these academics, primarily academics for some reason, who, you know, are white people who have who have created these identities for themselves rooted in some sort of race that they're not actually a part of. If people are willing to do that, like that's hard to fake. You got to perm your hair. You got to tan. You got to get hoop earrings or whatever. That's hard to do. If you if you want to fake being queer or non-binary, all you have to say is I'm queer or non-binary, and you do get this sort of you know people congratulate you. You feel like you're a part of something. That's probably a big part of it, is that people feel isolated from real communities. But um, but there's this weird element because like uh, you're a lesbian. Uh, you're gay, Tim. I- I'm Jewish, although not religious. If someone questioned me and said, you're not really Jewish, I'd be like, okay, fuck you. Because I'm an adult with a stable sense of self. I-, I think there's this thing, especially maybe with younger people, where like their identities are so fragile. And that, you know, people will literally at this point put their mental illnesses in their Twitter bio. A- and people so want to sort of be original and unique, but in this very pat play-by-numbers way. And I just wish people... I don't know. I'm trying to figure out what's causing this. I like to look at things psychologically. And I do think people have a very fragile sense of self and their only really validation is from strangers on the internet, which is a very unhealthy way to be. If anyone says you're not Jewish, just tell them you go, I look like a character from the Prince of Egypt. (laughs) Like I literally, what are you talking about? Like I look like every, you look like the meme a little bit, the happy merchant a little bit. Like the idea that you're not Jewish is absurd. But I don't, he's Italian. He's actually Italian posing as yeah, could be there. Is it that this online culture has kind of flattened everybody where, you know, I talk about this all the time. You meet people under a certain age. Um, they're weird in person. They're more comfortable <laughs> online. They, uh, they don't make eye contact. They don't really know how to speak to people at a dinner. They can't function. Um, a, a lot of these people, I feel like a lot of their experiences are very uniform because online culture, even though there are these diverse bubbles, everyone's talking about the same things they are on the same apps. It's similar algorithms. Do you think that people are, are just becoming dull and boring and drones and they're the lack of real community and the lack of real identifiable traits and characters. I don't talk about being gay a lot in my act. It's not interesting. Everybody knows that I am, but it, to me, it's not interesting. It's not 1987. I'm not dying of AIDS on a floor, although I'm sure people would love that. I yeah. just, um, I gravitate towards what I think is funny or interesting. I've never viewed someone who you fuck mattering. Like I, I know that it's mattered and people have suffered horrible discrimination for it, but I don't understand why we now believe that that's what makes you an individual is who you have sex with or what gender you identify as. To me, it's in, in just the least interesting thing about anybody. I want to know if you've run an insurance scam or if you ever considered faking your own death. I want to know, you know, what your parents uh, did for a living. And if you had an uncle that found gold in a fjord in Norway, like, I don't know why we're, we're just talking constantly about these really meaningless distinctions. Yeah, but in a lot of progressive communities, like the tra- trajectory has been the exact opposite. Like, you're, A, you're supposed to talk about identi- your identity all the time. B, if you experience any adversity, even online bullshit, you're supposed to act like you've been harmed horribly. So, you know, once in a while, some dumb teenager in like Ohio will send me an Auschwitz meme or whatever. It happens. You're, if you're Jewish online, it happens to you. The idea that I'm going to give that kid Which power, one? Is it the one with the... I'm kidding. Keep going. <laughs> Was that YouTube? <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, but the idea that I'm going to give that kid power, some like fucked up 17 year old power by being like, oh my God, this is a hate crime. What am I going to do? Especially when, you know, it's like with, with gay people and AIDS in the eighties, there was actual horrific anti-Semitism. Having some idiot tweet a meme at you on Twitter is not, it's not, it's nothing in the grand scheme of history. I don't understand. There's something about media culture and academic culture right now where it's gotten to the point where people will literally fake being black or biracial so they can it's so weird especially given how much actual oppression there is in the world that oppression just 
doesn't really take place on Twitter. What about well, it, yeah. it, it just it comes down to, to like tribalism and, and, you know, sort of team sports and turning turning everything into in, in, in our culture into these um, into teams. Like Jesse said, like someone can send him an Auschwitz meme. And sometimes I get Auschwitz meme because people think because of my last name that I'm Jewish. It's very flattering, um, you know, or, or, or say that he's a, you know, say that he's a stalker. And somehow it is more harmful for someone like Jesse to push back on the rumor that he's a stalker, the defamation that he's a stalker. Um, and he'll get accused of harassing people for responding to these, to these bullshit claims. Whereas, the act of calling someone a stalker is not somehow enough to get you run out of media. Lucy Nicotine is a company founded by Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for better and cleaner nicotine alternative. I've never smoked and have no addiction problems, but for some of you that do, you want to get the cigs out of your mouth. So they have three cool flavors, wintergreen, cinnamon, pomegranate. They're gum, it's a lozenge, you chew it, you suck it. Each and every flavor tastes great. It's convenient and discreet. They can be enjoyed anywhere, on flights, at work, or on the go, even in the gym. Call to action. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Not supposed to say that. It's 2021. Get rid of your cigarettes. Unplug your vape. Throw out your dip and get some Lucy Nicotine gum lozenges. Blah, 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 blah. It's 2021. Get rid of your cigarettes. Throw out your vape and the dip. Get some Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. This is the real deal. A subscription to Lucy comes directly to your door each month. It's so simple and you don't have to leave your house because Lucy has delivery down. The Tim Dillon Show listeners go to lucy.co. Use promo code Tim to get 20% off all products on your first order, including gum or lozenges. That's lucy.co. Use promo code Tim at checkout. Lucy.co, promo code T-I-M at checkout. Also, I have to give this disc <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Leave that in. Also, I have to give this disclaimer. Warning, this product contains nicotine derived from tobacco. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Magic Spoon is a cereal. It's great. It's keto. It's neato. It's got zero grams of sugar, 13, 14 grams of protein, four net grams of carbs in each serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, GMO-free. We've got exciting news. Magic Spoon will be releasing two amazing new flavors this month for a limited time only. We're talking about cookies and cream and maple waffle. And if that isn't the most comforting, indulgent combination, I don't know what is. This is the ultimate treat yourself combo. So make sure you get some while you can for a limited time. Build your own box. We've got custom bundles, cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, and cinnamon. If you're not listening from Canada, Magic Spoon now ships there as well. Or if you are listening from Canada, go to magicspoon.com slash Tim Dillon to grab the new limited edition cookies and cream, maple waffle, or a custom butter. Can we get some of this shit for free? Mm -hmm. I, I can't get anything here. Yeah. And be sure to use some of this promo code Tim Dillon and check out and save $5 off your order. This offer is now good anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, but only when you use our code at checkout. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's back with 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. What about this alliance, which I find hilarious, between like these mega corporations and woke culture? This seems to be like the big dominant theme in 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 the, you know capitalist America right now is that like you have these uh, companies like Nike that have literally slave labor camps in China producing uh, their the shoes they sell. But they also are doing as much as they can vocally to support all of these different movements. It's very funny. You know, the woke corporate CEO is hilarious to me. Um, other than it just being, you know, kind of buffoonish and cartoonish, um, it does seem to be a real danger because you you have basically these corporations that are like, listen, we want to continue with unfair labor practices, paying people low wages. We don't want to give anyone health care. We want to continually shit on the middle class in this country. We don't mind um, you know, making billions and billions of dollars essentially on the backs of people who are not paying fairly as long as we engage in this performative activism and, and come down on the right side. Is this this weird, unholy alliance between big business uh, and, and, and these profit-driven enterprises and this kind of, you know, virulent strain of woke culture? And does it enable those companies to kind of continue doing what they're doing and escape a lot of criticism? I mean, I, I think so. If I was someone who called myself a leftist radical and my rhetoric was completely indistinguishable from like Raytheon and Halliburton's diversity statements, I would I would <laughs> ask certain questions about that. A lot of this shit is just symbolic, man. I mean, if you focus all day on this stuff or like putting a dis I watched an episode of Mad Men and they put a disclaimer about how a guy was going to have blackface when 
anyone who watches this episode knows the whole point is this guy's an asshole. Why is he in blackface? Th these are symbolic moves that don't really challenge power in, in any way. And I, I don't know. There's an, everyone uses the term performative, but that's what it is. Do you think any of these companies would actually raise wages in a meaningful way or improve their labor practices or not, you know, employ slave labor in China? It's all, it gets exhausting really quickly. I feel like. Right. You see the same thing in education. So you have these, you know, private schools, particularly private high schools in places like L.A. and, and New York, where they're going through this very performative sort of diversity trainings um, where, you know, teachers or students or whoever are, are encouraged to sort of confess their whiteness. When if, if these schools actually this is something Caitlin Flanagan pointed out in The Atlantic, these schools are mostly untaxed. So, it, you know, they're sitting on billion dollar endowments. And if they actually wanted to do something to address inequalities uh, or inequities in education, what they would do is, 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 is you know, fight for, for to, to revoke their own uh, nonprofit tax status um, or tax exemption, or they would give away their fucking endowment to the shitty public school down the street. But instead, what they do is like build another waterfall or a theme park on their campus and then bring in a diversity trainer. It's all it's just it's just performance. Yeah, it's 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 wild to watch. I don't know where it uh, where it ends. It's uh, I tend to think we all have five to seven years to make money, and then we're all out of here. So uh, yeah, save okay. your money. No, I mean I'm dead serious about that, and I've said this before. I believe, um, and this is not any. I don't want to be right about this. I believe that if things kind of keep going the way they're going, there's a small window of time that people are going to have to build fan bases online, and then that too will be extinguished. Do you think I'm being too dramatic? The thing you should have been kicked off of Patreon probably yeah. 17 episodes ago, but they're not going to kick you off because you're bringing in too much money. Yeah, well, I think maybe. Do you maybe listen to the Patreon the episodes? I don't. I, I don't listen to those. I should. I mean, I they're very funny. I think. Patreon shows that are big, like Chapo and Come Town and myself, we're all wild yeah. and we're all funny and we're all comics yeah. and obviously Chapo's more political, but like there doesn't, I don't know, there's no, nobody's engaging like hate speech or whatever. I'm not rallying anyone to a cause. You did, you did threaten to, to bomb those lesbian Subaru. Those they clearly lesbians deserved it. Are, <laughs> they deserved those it. are, those are, they deserved it. They, deserved they are it. crafty and you got to watch them. Um, I agree. And, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell him about this at the next meetup. Yeah. Well, there's only nine of you left. That's that article you posted. <laughs> so I'm sure you all know each other. There's nine lesbians left. Every we now and then, Katie together. will go dark for a few days, and then she'll just pop her head out with like, <laughs> "There are nine lesbians left, and we and I will fighting for." And the, you said there's no lesbian bars, right? Isn't that your pet cause now? Uh, yeah, but I'll never go to not n not neutering animals and more dyke <laughs> bars. I believe that's the beat yeah. you're on now. Yeah, that's it. I want, How did you I want two I meet? I mean, obviously you wrote the articles, and then everybody everyone hates you both. But how did you guys become friends? You seem to have like a real friendship. It's kind of like heartwarming. It's 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 real. like a Patreon <laughs> friendship, really. <laughs> it's more of a. I think of Jesse as my pod bottom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, Katie's my uh, Katie's my RODL, my ride or die lesbian. Now, yeah, do yeah. people like, like Andrew Sullivan, who doesn't return emails? I don't know who he thinks he is. <laughs> guys, out of his mind. But th who are the kings of Substack? You have Greenwald. Who are the Matt, big dogs on Substack? Matt, Matt Taibbi, Taibbi, Glenn Greenwald, this well random histo this historian of all person who's really good, Heather Rock, Cox Richardson. Who are the other ones? Uh, uh, Yasha Monk, Sullivan, Yasha Monk, Andrew Sullivan. Yeah. Uh, oh, Matt Glacius. Glacius is huge. Yeah, a bunch of cis white men. And what are they all making? Money, millions, uh, uh, more over, than five hundred thousand. The more than uh, more than a million. You I think mean, a few of the like, multiple? Okay. Yeah. Well, in the case of Andrew, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if he's if he's I don't think he's even number one. But that's what's so, so that's the, what's so weird yeah. about this is like there's there's massive demand for these opinions and these are not bigoted reactionary opinions and yet these guys don't really have a place at like mainstream outlets and then the mainstream outlets wonder why they're losing credibility it's a weird process to watch this unfold well the great thing about this is so after there's been this insane like Substack war over the past week where Substack so so for your audience who doesn't know Substack is a is a newsletter platform so it's basically a bunch of independent writers who you cultivate your own list and then they can give you money and you can make a shit ton of money if you if you've got a big list and so there's been all of these people threatening to leave Substack because of people like Jesse and Glenn Greenwald and Andrew Sullivan and me to a lesser degree 
But the platform that they're talking about going to is this platform called Ghost, which is like a total free speech platform. <laughs> so I think what we do is that all of us just need to migrate over to Ghost and they'll have to leave that one too. We can slowly deplatform these people by just moving to whatever. Dude, I'll, I'll commit to. to this now. If three or more of the people who complained about my presence on Substack all move to the same platform, I will start a newsletter there. Just well, isn't it, isn't the, the thing with the Substack that they're paying advances to people? People are upset about yeah. that, that they're getting I large. Didn't, I, I didn't get one, but the really big names, they'll give them an advance. And then, um, yeah, it's just an advance. Then then they take that out of their earnings. So it's it's the same thing a book publisher does. People are treating this as like a weird conspiratorial thing. People are also forgetting that Substack is a for-profit company. It's very hard to like pin down what the exact complaint is. So you'll have someone with one twentieth of the experience and audience of Andrew Sullivan treating it as a scandal that Substack wanted Andrew Sullivan to come on board. Andrew Sullivan now makes more than a million dollars, according to Katie. So it's been weird because I don't know. He's I don't also a guy that like pioneered about. blogging. He's yeah. been in the game for decades. He's published yeah. multiple books. Like there is, there is a reason that you would pay a guy like that in advance. Right. And the, I don't think he even took the advance because the advance, if you're, if you're really big, the advance is, I think, at the high end, $250,000. But if you can make a million dollars a year on the platform, there's no reason to do it. Yeah. Um, so is for, this the future of journalism, do you think? Or is, is that overstating it to a degree? Uh, I hope not. The problem yeah. is, like, I think there'll always be people that, like, me and, you know, Katie and I are both in our late 30s. We've been around a while. We've built up audience. We're, we're lucky enough that we'll probably all, always, I think, be able to make a living just with our like dumb opinions and Katie's anti-Semitism and stuff. The yeah. problem yeah. is like actual journalism, like who's covering the cops, who's covering city hall. There's almost no money for that. And that's what I'm most worried about. I'm not worried about us. I'm worried about like fucking 50 year old guys who built up a career covering the police. Who's going to cover the police in 10 years. I, I, I think no one knows the answer to that. So I'm much more worried about that than the people everyone's bitching about on Substack. That's a great question. Yeah. Who's going to do the like shoe leather actual reporting on institutions, public institutions? Right. A, a bigger threat to journalism is not Substack. It's the same threat that has been or decimating it for the past 15 years, which is Google and Craigslist and Facebook. It's the fact that local papers have been hollowed out. But you don't see the people bitching about Substack platforming people like Jesse doing anything to, you know, to, to help out of the real crisis, which is the fact that local papers are dying. Well, I, I like both of you. I wish both of you the best of luck. I, I Your show is called Blocked and Reported. It's growing. People really enjoy it. People like it. Um, you know, and I mean, I, I urge all my followers and fans to go check it out. It's a kind of refreshing, uh, you know, you have a good rapport, both of you, and you both certainly... Uh, I just, we're just so bored of the trance, you know, we're, we we were in a very low profile war with the Weinstein brothers yeah. and, um, you know, the war that no one asked for and no one wanted, but I, I've declared war on the intellectual dark web and they've responded in kind. And, um, I've taken Lex Friedman from them. I've taken Lex <laughs> and, uh, and I, and, but, but, uh, I made a joke where I was like the greatest minds of our time, just talking about trans stuff all the time. And it's like boring to me. I mean, how about this? Like I get it. I would not give any kid hormones, but it's kind of like, Hey, if you transition and it doesn't work out, it's almost like you got a bad tattoo. I'm kind of treating it now. Like, Hey man, you fucked up. Maybe there's gotta be more of that in society. Maybe we have to say you were a stupid seven year old and, Sorry, you know? And now you don't have a penis. And now you don't have a penis. And I don't know. I just, it it sucks all the air out of the room. But I do understand why it's important to talk about. Did you see the head of drag queen story hour got busted with a bunch of child porn? Yeah. What's going on over there? I don't you take know. this that one, Katie. Just the, I guess you just like, he was too much of a cutie, of a cuties fan. I think that's what I'm what telling you right now. Anyone who wants to read to children is automatically suspect drag queen or not. <laughs> anyone who goes to a library voluntarily to read dumb books to kids is so stupid that and I, anyone who has a child, I think falls into that category. Anyone, well, who, has a, anyone, anyone who has a child is a pedophile. There's no yeah. other explanation. I, I, I think that yeah, having children is somewhat important because you need, uh, you need to, to raise a well-regulated militia that will guarantee the security of the free state. <laughs> Kim, you should become a sperm donor. I think I know some lesbians who, uh, Mila and Jonah, they live in Do Palm you know, Spain. I'm literally asking, do you know them? 
No, I don't know though. I don't. I did look them up on Instagram. I did find them on Instagram. They they did a whole thing where they were like, we love Joe Rogan and we'll let him sp spend time in our home because he likes our furniture or whatever. You know, these are, um, I am off Airbnb. I'm literally the platform that cannot get back on. I've tried. Um, it's a complete and utter, uh, you know, campaign to destroy me. And, yeah. uh, but I will continue to fight. I had no idea that it would get so contentious with these ladies. And they call me fat, which is ableist. Uh, why are they on the platform? I don't know why they're allowed to be on the platform. It's odd to me that they're able to be on the platform, but apparently there are different rules. Tell everyone where they can find both of you, uh, your show and everything. Is there going to be like a Substack convention? Do you guys, do you guys like do like a big, do you do like a meet and greet with like you guys and Barry Weiss and Andrew Sullivan? Like, does that, <laughs> does that ever happen? Do you guys do like a meet and greet convention, MagCon, but yeah. for a there Substack? There was actually, was it two years ago now, we had a, uh, a happy hour for Katie in Brooklyn and Andrew Sullivan was there. It was a good night. Yeah, um, wow. True. What a so, fun and night. The main and Andrew was drinking Jaeger shots, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, everyone check us out, please. Patreon.com slash blotch reported. I'm at jessysingle.substack.com if you want to see why all my horrible reactionary stuff that uh, they tried to deplatform me over. And then, uh, oh, yeah, I have a book coming out. Totally separate subject, but check out The Quick Fix. It's out April 6th if you want to support me and Katie. Uh, What's it about? Yeah. It's about like sort of bullshit TED Talk psychology and why we keep f uh, falling for it. It's 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 not culture war -y, but I, I think people will like it and should uh, give it a Google maybe. Katie Herzog, where can the where can the people find you? They can't. I'm in a bunker in Western Washington. I don't want them to find me. Um, I am on Twitter at Kitty Perzog. I have a Substack newsletter called Moose Nuggets, which is as as you mentioned, is about canine testicles, the most pressing issue. Um, in America right now. And what else? Yeah, check out the podcast. That's pretty much all I do. I'm a, I'm really more of a part-time worker at this point. Yeah, I mean, Katie's very funny. We always, Ben Ben thinks you're very funny, my producer. Very funny. That was yeah. a very funny email you sent I think, me. I yeah, ben, ben, ben is like in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think Ben's very handsome, so maybe we can, uh, maybe we can talk about oh, Thank after. you, Katie. I believe I am the looker on the show. That is what I, that is what <laughs> I believe because I am the, the, the show is me. So if people weren't looking at me, they wouldn't watch. Maybe Katie Herzog. You just have Ben sit behind you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I literally, this is true. When I lived in California, I, I was talking to this, uh, uh, this, 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 there was a high school track kid in my neighborhood who used to run around <laughs> and I was convinced. Going? I know where we're going. I, know I was, going no, it's just a thin high school track kid. <laughs> And I would always ask him about trans issues and he had to tell me he wasn't Katie Herzog. He was just a thin key. He had to tell me and I said, Katie, I, I had no idea you could afford to live in this neighborhood. Let's <laughs> yeah, we'll be real. Yeah. And, uh, but it apparently was not you when I learned that the hard way. Um, but we do appreciate both of you coming on. We're fans and we hope that you guys continue to thrive. Good to talk to you, Tim. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Tim.